Okay, good morning everyone. So this is the 16th webinar of PAASE. So again, PAASE is the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering. And uh, this is an organization which consists of scientists and engineers of Philippine descent um, based in the Philippines and in the United States. But now we have um, other members from other countries as well. So thank you for joining us uh, this morning. So we will begin with a webinar in a few seconds. To our viewers on YouTube, you please feel free to type in any questions you might have for the panel. So good morning, it's eight o'clock. So we will now uh, begin with our webinar. So today is a special uh, session for the Paasa webinar because we don't have just one speaker. We actually have a panel of speakers, but um, I will uh, let our first speaker introduce the rest of the team um, in his talk. So our speaker is a professor of chemical engineering and a university fellow at De La Salle University and an academician of the Philippine National Academy of Science and Technology. So for those of you who have been um, watching us and joining us in our past webinars, you probably know him already. So I will let him um, introduce the rest of the team and the rest of the project. So without further ado, uh, may I call on Professor Raymond Pan. Thank you, Dr. K. Good morning, everyone. Let me just uh, begin by sharing my screen. All right, um, good morning once again. Our talk is in Malaysia and the Philippines. Uh, my name is Raymond Tan. With me this morning, uh, we have uh, colleagues who are part of the research team, Professor Denny Ang of Harriet Watt University and uh, our team economist, Dr. Krista Daniel Yu. We'll also be making brief press work that involves uh, three universities. Uh, Harriet Watt University is the lead university, De La Salle University, uh, is the Philippine partner and the University of Nottingham, uh, the Malaysia campus is also involved. And uh, the non-academic partner is the Young Scientists Network of Malaysia, which is under the ASM, the Academy Science Malaysia. All right, seem to be having some technical difficulties. Let me sort this out first. All right, let me introduce the members of the research team. The project is led by Dr. Viknesh Andiyapan Murugapan, who's uh, uh, at Harriet Watt University. In the Harriet Watt team is uh, Professor Denny Ang, who will be making his part of the presentation about the Malaysian data, and their postdoc, uh, Dr. Steve Fu, Dr. Nishant Chamagatuvalabal, and my colleagues from the Philippines, uh, our host. Professor K. Abiso and Dr. Krista Daniel Yu. The project is funded under the Harriet Watt University's GCRF fund. There was a COVID call several months ago and we secured a grant for a two and a half month project to look at uh, optimizing lockdown exit strategies and doing a comparative analysis of the Philippines and of Malaysia. 
And in particular, we, we had two things in mind. We had to look at the different sectors that comprise both economies. And we decided to zoom in particularly on the agro industry sectors by looking at major commodity crops in both countries. And we decided well, in the case of Malaysia, there's uh, oil palm and the associated downstream industries. And in the Philippines, of course, coconut and likewise the downstream industries. And uh, we used uh, economic modeling techniques coupled with operations research to uh, develop recovery strategies for both countries. If you wish to know more about the project, uh, this QR code will lead you to the link. Uh, which is on the website of Harriet Watt University with a bit more description. And of course, uh, eventually we expect uh, a paper to be published, both the methodology that we developed and uh, the application to the case of the Philippines and uh, a brief summary of what's happening in Malaysia using the same modeling techniques, because it may be possible to glean insights by looking at common features of both countries and likewise looking at what is different between the two countries. Now, uh, COVID-19 has taken the world by storm. Uh, initially, there was plenty of worry just about the clinical and health issues. After four or five months, uh, people are starting to worry about the economic impacts as, as well we should because there are going to be impacts on individual economic sectors and on the livelihoods of people. And uh, thus, if we look at uh, agro-industrial supply chains in both countries, it's essential that we try to figure out the optimal recovery strategies that can be applied by figuring out the priority rank of the different sectors. How important are they to the rest of the economy? And uh, how to optimize optimize any stimulus package which may be available in limited amount. So I'll talk next about the Philippine economy, which had been on such a nice upward trajectory. Okay, it seems that we have lost uh, Raymond for a while there. Okay, maybe we can just um, wait a bit. Raymond, you seem to be on mute. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm back. Uh, just a minor technical glitch. So that 6% plus annual growth rate that we're expecting to continue into this decade has been interrupted by this pandemic. Okay, um, I suppose uh, okay. the technique that we used in this work is known as input-output analysis. It's a mainstream tool in economics, which was developed by Vasily Leontiev, a uh, Nobel laureate who won the prize specifically for developing this technique. And the input-output analysis is based on a network model of an economic system. So on screen, we see a low resolution representation of a hypothetical economy consisting of agriculture, manufacturing, and services. And on the right hand of the screen is the economic output, which goes to final consumption or the 
purchases by actual households, physical goods or services. This is a low resolution input output model. Conceptually, this can be applied at any arbitrary level of resolution. So for instance, there are developed countries wherein this is done at the level of having 400, 500 individual boxes or sectors which are linked in a network like this. The consequences of the linkage are that uh, the sectors, uh, when the sectors are disrupted, these uh, disruptions ripple through the network and uh, can affect downstream and upstream sectors. And you could imagine, for example, if you have a drop in restaurant uh, patronage because of the pandemic, then you would have uh, resulting supply chain effects on the suppliers of the restaurant, which provide the food, the packaging, the detergents, and whatever else they need to purchase for normal operations. And this sort of cascade effect ripples to an economic system. And it's important to have a model because many of these ripple effects are not immediately evident just by direct observation. You'd have to actually calculate those effects, especially if they're second, third, fourth degree effects. Okay, uh, what we've done is we had to settle on a degree of resolution which was fine enough that we would get some reasonable insights, but also it would not have done to have hundreds of sectors represented in a, in a webinar such as this. So we thought 16 would be a reasonable size. What we also did was we disaggregated four manufacturing sectors, which are linked to coconut oil, refining of coconut oil and production of downstream derivatives. So that uh, then left us with manufacturing of all other products being aggregated still into the large composite sector, which is number eight on screen. So these are data based on official Philippine statistics. Um, Raymond, would you want, I, I can share the slides on my end so that you can just do the, the talk. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, yeah. Oh, I need to stop sharing. <clears throat> okay, I hope that you can see the slides now. Okay, just let me know when to proceed. Okay, thanks. Um, well, uh, what we also did was we revisited a technique for criticality uh, criticality analysis, which we developed uh, about six years ago. And we thought that there should be a way to rank different economic sectors in terms of how important they are, both for themselves and for the rest of the economy. And the initial work we had in 2014 had uh, three criteria, economic impact, connectivity, and sector size. And of course, uh, we called it vulnerability index in the original paper. We realized criticality is a much more appropriate and more descriptive term. And we added for this installment, the income multiplier and employment effects of these different sectors. And uh, if we proceed to the next, uh, okay, on the right-hand side of the slide, we have the updated sector criticality index or SEI, which is a five component index of how important the sectors are. And uh, we then include weights, which are uh, normalized to sum up to unity and initially assume equal weighting of these components. So that's 0.2 for each of them. We also did a panel survey. Uh, we took 11 experts from academia, government, and industry in both countries. And uh, we conducted a survey on how important each of these five components are. And they came up with weightings which are shown at the bottom of the screen, which as you will see are slightly different from the initial assumption of equal weights. 
So if we go to the next slide, uh, we were able to calculate the SCI values of the 16 economic sectors, which are shown here. The colored bands represent the five components. So you can see the next thing we can do is rank these sectors from the most critical to the least critical, which is shown in the next slide. So that's exactly the same data, but now ranked from highest to lowest. And you would see then uh, the, the data that shown here represents how critical each of these sectors uh, is relative to the economic system and manufacturing sector, which is highlighted if we, okay, if you would click. Okay, that's the most important sector because of its size, because of its, uh, not so much the employment size and the economic impact. Now, the sectors that we were interested in specifically in terms of the agro-industrial coconut supply chain are ranked much lower. Uh, the coconut farming sector is ranked uh, in the middle of the pack, just above the midpoint. And of course, those downstream manufacturing sectors that rely primarily on coconut as input. Uh, sector seven, four, and five, um, and six are ranked much lower. In the next slide, we would then uh, see a visualization of SEI. And uh, by using a radar chart like this, you can get a visual sense of the contributions of the five components to the SEI composite score of these different sectors. And of course, the rankings are the same, but the size of those uh, polygons give an index, a very rough visual representation of the SEI values. If we proceed to the next slide, uh, we would then see that the four downstream industrial sectors that are linked to the coconut industry are ranked uh, relatively low in criticality. Right, uh, next slide, please. If we revisit the same data, of course, the weights that we assign to the five components of the SCI influence the, the rankings that we derive. And we would look at these and we can see the diamonds and the X's represent the, the rankings that we get if we use the equal weighting assumption or if we were to use the assumptions uh, of weights based on the 11 experts that were surveyed. And there really isn't much of a difference that uh, arises from that. It's more interesting to do Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, what we did was we looked at how the indices would vary if we were to simulate different weighting values. And that re results in an error bar, which gives you a range of how much the SEI value of each sector might change if the priorities shift, say, if you were to put more value towards employment or, or such. And the, the way to read this chart is, as when you look at data with error bars, it's important to look at the midpoints, which represent the point estimates of the SEIs of these sectors. But looking at the margins, the upper bounds and lower bounds would give you the extent of overlap. And for example, I direct your attention to the last four sectors, ranked uh, utilities, sector 10, petroleum refineries, six, manufactured refined coconut oil is five, and real estate, 14. These are the bottom sectors ranked from uh, 13 through 16. But if you inspect closely the margins or the the possible variations in value, there's significant overlap. So the actual rankings, you might as well call it a tie for these last four because there's so much overlap, you can't really say that one is much more critical than the other. Uh, the differences in score are, are minute compared to the overlaps. Next slide, please. Still, of course, uh, the composite aggregated manufacturing sector is still the most critical, even when we take into account the margins. And uh, those involving coconut, uh, not so much. Right, next slide, please. Now, uh, a little bit about the 
pandemic in the Philippines, uh, I just learned that in terms of uh, statistically, in terms of active cases, we're now at uh, close to 40,000. In terms of cumulative cases, it's over 60,000. And there have been, of course, as in many countries throughout the world, the efforts to stem the spread of the virus through lockdown measures, so which were uh, very strict early on, but there's been uh, recognition more recently that the lockdowns need to be calibrated because it needs to be sustained for a longer period than was initially believed. So if we proceed to the next, uh, next slide, uh, the national lockdown, of course, comes in different levels. There's GCQ and ECQ, and we may need to go back and forth between different levels in different geographic locales based on the conditions. Uh, of, it's like an engineering control system and you adjust the lockdown level based on data that you get. Back to the GDP profile, uh, we were on a very nice upward trajectory. We expect a dip in 2020 as a result of the pandemic, which we would see on screen. But uh, once the pandemic is over or brought under control, then uh, the economy is expected to spring back, uh, not quite to the level of the six, 7% growth that we enjoyed throughout much of the previous decade, but our uh, resident economist is projecting a level of about 4% to the middle of the next, uh, rather of the current decade. But uh, we're looking conservatively at what may be a very dire economic picture for 2020 with up to 11% contraction compared to the previous year. Next slide, please. What does that spell for the individual, the 16 sectors that we had disaggregated from the IO data? One of the data we can look at would be economic loss, which is how much reduction in output as measured in billions of pesos do we observe in each of these sectors relative to what would have happened had there been no pandemic. And we see here on screen, these are the sectors which are uh, most critical in terms of just sheer economic loss. Another metric we can use is so-called inoperability. This was proposed uh, by uh, Just Santos in his work, uh, well, he's now with George Washington University. Uh, this was done as part of his PhD work almost 20 years ago. Inoperability is a fractional reduction in economic output. And it gives you a different sort of ranking compared to the sheer magnitude of uh, economic loss. And as you can see here, for example, if we look at sector number six, it doesn't rank very high in terms of the volume of economic loss in billions of pesos. Uh, but if you were to look at the inoperability value, it's actually worst off with suffering about uh, close to 50% inoperability. And this is a significant result because when economic, uh, when policymakers develop economic policy, the issue is not just how much economic value is being lost, but is that economic sector going to be able to bounce back after the crisis? And this is highly dependent, not just on the, the size of the economy or the sector, but how far has it deviated from its normal state in terms of percentage or a fraction. So looking at both of these metrics, the economic loss and inoperability would give you uh, better insights on what to do. And in this case, for instance, uh, there is severe impact on uh, coconut related sectors. Next slide, please. And we take a look at both of these metrics to prioritize financial aid for economic recovery. Right, next slide, please. Uh, one other intervention that we simulated uh, is the infusion of stimulus funds into individual sectors. And in this chart, we show the results of the effect of infusing 10 billion pesos of stimulus funds into each sector 
individually without infusing funding into any of the other sectors. So for example, if we were to take 10 billion pesos and infuse that into sector one, what happens is because you have an economic network where the sectors are all interconnected to some degree, that actually results in additional benefits. So we put in 10 billion pesos, but if you look at sector one, which is the leftmost bar, the change in output is about 17 billion pesos. So there's a multiplier effect that results from the infusion. And this is for the total economy that actually is distributed across different sectors. And the green portion of the bar represents how much of that benefit accrues to the sectors that we flagged as being linked to the coconut agro-industrial supply chain. So once again, we look at both total economy-wide effects and the share that uh, is felt by the coconut industry which are shown by the green bars in this histogram. And if we were to do that sequentially, if we were to place the 10 billion pesos just in sector two, what results would we get? Um, here, less benefit to the entire economy, but much more of the lion's share going to the coconut sectors. And we did that sequentially through all 16 sectors to figure out the sensitivity of the responses. Next slide, please. Uh, there's actually a stimulus package being discussed now, which is intended to help uh, start up the economy again. Uh, this is what we expect the effect to be. So if we show the graphics, uh, next slide, please, okay, forward, please. And forward, please. This is the stimulus package being discussed and we would see how that affects Potentially, we can see some benefits by some reduction in economic losses and some reduction in, in operability of some sectors. It's quite notable that sector 13 actually has a very large benefit in terms of both getting uh, actually increased economic output rather than decreased and negative in operability, meaning it, it gets more, uh, more value or more economic activity than it would have without the pandemic. The question now is, is there a way to optimize the stimulus package to get the most bang for the buck, so to speak? So if you look at the next slide. Next slide, please. We combined input output analysis with operations research. And we set up a mathematical program with the objective of optimizing the allocation of stimulus funds. And we had four scenarios. Number one is a scenario based on trying to maintain the GDP level from the previous year, which is the total final demand of the economy without constraining the distribution across the different sectors. And we figured out uh, through this model, we found that the minimum stimulus fund required is 1.4 trillion pesos in order to achieve this goal. And as a matter of fact, the model tells us that all of this 1.4 trillion pesos should be put into the various manufacturing sectors. And the benefits would then accrue to the rest of the economy via ripple effects or via the network linkages within the economic system. We looked at scenario two, which is a bit more ambitious. We try to maintain the total GDP of 2019 and also maintain the GDP share of each of the sectors. In other words, uh, whereas previously we were looking at just the total, now we were looking at, uh, in scenario two, looking at each sector maintaining its uh, final demand in 2020. And upon optimization, it turns out that we require almost 2.5 trillion pesos of stimulus funds with about 10% of this being allocated to the coconut related sectors, That's both the coconut farming and the downstream agro-industrial sectors, while uh, just under 90% would be distributed throughout the rest of the economy. In scenario three, we looked at the more ambitious picture of uh, 
trying to maintain this, the original 6.5% GDP growth forecast that we had for this year, while maintaining a lower bound of uh, 2019 GDP for each of the individual sectors. This scenario requires uh, almost 2.8 trillion pesos of stimulus funds, of which 8% would have to be distributed to the coconut related sectors. And the pie chart down here then shows the distribution through the rest of the economy, but 8% goes to coconut industry. Now, these are all very ambitious. So we then decided to look at a more conservative end of the scale, assuming a limited amount of 1.5 trillion pesos of stimulus funds. We imposed a constraint of no more than 10% in operability for any of the sectors in the economy. And upon optimization, we found out that the constraints imposed would result in a 3.2% contraction of the economy measured in terms of total GDP. This will require 1.3 trillion pesos of stimulus funds of which about 16% goes to the agro-industrial sectors linked to the coconut industry. So if we go to the next slide and examine sector four more closely, this is the baseline that we're looking at. This is the damage done by the pandemic, if we then show the animation, we would see the mitigation effects of scenario four. So forward, please, so that we can see the results. That's the 10% inoperability constraint. And as you can see, by imposing the inoperability limit, the red line, which was the original uncontrolled scenario, shifts upward and we have the dotted green line, which shows the resulting inoperability upon infusion of the stimulus funds into the various sectors of the economy. Oh, next slide, please. So that concludes the Philippine picture. And uh, what we see is that it is actually possible to calibrate the stimulus package distribution based on knowledge of the linkages of the different sectors of the economy. And of course, it is possible to prioritize sectors based on uh, either inoperability or based on the economic loss from the uncontrolled scenario or based on criticality. And uh, it turns out that it is possible to have, uh, it would need as much as 2.8 trillion pesos to maintain the initial GDP forecast, which may be unrealistic. Scenario four is the damage control scenario where we limit 10% inoperability and would require just uh, about half of the previous scenarios stimulus funds. Next up, of course, it's important to note that this is generic methodology and you can take any country and apply this to their data. And let's have a look at the Malaysian scenario to be discussed by Professor Denny Ng so that we can look at a comparison of these two countries and look for common features as well as contrasting effects. So that concludes my part. Okay, thank you for that, um, Professor Tan. Uh, okay, Denny, uh, would you like me to share the slides or will you share it from your end? Morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. I have, um, I've shared my screen. Uh, do you able to see? Okay, yes, I can. we can see it. Okay, you may proceed. Okay, I will proceed. Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Raymond Tan, for the brief introductions or detailed discussions about the case uh, that we have done for Philippines focusing on coconut. Uh, in Malaysia, our major agro industry is palm oil. So I will take this opportunity to share some of the results that we have done on looking at the similar model that we developed application in the palm oil industry in Malaysia. So we actually following the same uh, model that we have developed or the methodology, we actually based on Malaysia input output model, we identified 15 sectors. And you can see that uh, we categorize them into agri, mining, manufacturing, constructions, and services. And the highlighted in green is uh, the industry that is related or the sectors that is related to the palm oil, which, is, uh, which are the I2, the sector two, sector four, 
sector five and sector six. The four, five, six are mainly on the downstream of the palm oil. After the extraction of the crude palm oil, we send for the refinery to produce various uh, palm-based products. So again, uh, we actually analyze the sectors fertility uh, index, SCI, for all the sectors. And then we follow the sex, uh, sector one to sector 15, uh, following the same approach that we have done for the Philippine case study. So we rearrange them. Uh, one of the interesting notes that I would like to share here is we also having the same uh, sectors, which is same with Philippine, whereby the other manufacturing sectors rank number one. However, we have slightly different uh, observations for the, sorry, for the palm oil sectors. You can notice that um, I4, which is the industry uh, sectors four, Sector two, sector uh, five, and sector six are really palm oil related sectors. They are also ranked less critical comparing to the uh, government services or the manufacturing sectors. And they are mainly ranked number eight, nine, 11, and 14. So we, we analyze a similar uh, behavior or what are the impact on the sectors when this pandemic has started or actually if we adopt any control systems or similar package that we introduce from the government, uh, what is going to impact on our current um, situations. And you can notice that the, um, which is the sector six, uh, which causes the most, uh, sector seven, sorry, sector seven, causes the most economic losses, followed by sector 11 and sector 15. So this is the sectors that we look at the criticality just now. We have conduct, I've shown you in the graph uh, previously. And to show that this is the three uh, sectors that most impacted uh, economically. We also look at an improbability that just has same approach. And one of the observations that we ob obtain is the sector number four is actually achieving 25% of reductions in the immobility. And we can look at that, palm oil or the agriculture's uh, industry, which is the sector four and sector two, uh, pretty, I mean, inoperability. So you can observe that a lot, although that we have not uh, noticed, there's no direct economic uh, impact or huge economic impact loss in the agro industry. Unfortunately, it actually caused a uh, huge inoperability issues in the uh, uh, palm oil sectors. So I just do on the comparisons here, what happened in the Philippines and Malaysia. Um, Philippines actually declared uh, the lockdown uh, in since, 15th of March until present. However, in Malaysia, we started on the 18th of March. Uh, we finished our, we call it control movement order in June 9th. And then we move into the con uh, recovery phase now in, until 31st of August. Uh, we estimate the reductions of the GDP in Philippines is 5.71. Meanwhile, in Malaysia, we are expected about 3.1. Uh, the reasons is, uh, I think, because the Philippines, uh, they are still rising on the COVID-19 uh, cases. Meanwhile, Malaysia, we have stopped, uh, start declining into a single digit in the past few days. Therefore, a lot of uh, activity, economic activity has been resumed in Malaysia. Uh, we would like to see there is a bounce back in the GDP increase or it's not significantly impact comparing to the Philippines situations. So, uh, but one of the interesting note that I would like to share here is other manufacturing are the most critical sectors regardless of Malaysia or Philippines. They are behaviorally the same, but for the Philippines, um, the, the second rank is actually trading 
the government, then followed by the uh, private sectors. Meanwhile, in Malaysia, we will be impacted on the government, then followed by the trading and the private sectors. So they're slightly ranked between the sectors. Uh, therefore, uh, what the country government, each country government will do a different kind of a simulated package. So um, what is the most critical impacted um, in, in, the, in each country? So we had the uh, Philippine cases where petroleum refinery, construction and train. However, in Malaysia, the very obvious impacted uh, critical affected uh, sectors are the oil and fats manufacturing, palm oil and trading. So uh, what we have a uh, similar package that we really introduced by our government. Uh, in Philippines, we have 300 over 81 billion uh, peso. Meanwhile, in Malaysia, we have 21.6 billion ringgit to be introduced. And with that, uh, what we can work, because we actually pay a lot of attention on our agro industry, we noted that there, in Philippines, there's none located directly or indirectly to coconut related sectors. However, in Malaysia, we still have small portion of the of the in, uh, civil package that directly introduced into the palm oil industry. Although Malaysia actually identified as the most critical affected uh, by palm oil, but we only get a share of 0.9%. Based on that, uh, using our model that we developed, the input output model with the operational strategies research uh, that we have introduced, the optimization model that we developed, we observed that uh, in order for us to really bring back the economic performance of the sectors, uh, in Philippines, we are talking about 1.3 trillion of pesos required, which, uh, which contribute 15.7% to be allocated in the coconut industry. Meanwhile, in Malaysia, we actually have to increase from 21.6 billion to 66.5 billion. Uh, we are 37% or more, slightly more to be allocated in the palm oil so that we were able to achieve the minimum inoperability of 10% for each sector while maintaining the GDP uh, of the previous. So as a conclusion, uh, we, our team, um, we will be pleased to share with you that uh, we have developed a techniques based on the economic input output models that account for the network effects across the sectors. So we are studying on the interconnectivity of the sectors and then taking all the five metrics or the uh, measurements, inclusive of the employability, the economic, and so on and so forth, to analyze the criticality of each sectors. The techniques able to prioritize for us how to we invest or rescue all the sectors, and then through the direct and indirect uh, infusions of the funds to the different sectors, we are able to bring back the economic, the government or the country economy or GDP in the coming years. Uh, based on the result, you noted that uh, manufacturing sectors is always determined as the most critical sectors of both countries. Uh, reasons being uh, our countries are still focusing uh, very much on manufacturers. Uh, in Malaysia in particularly, we have more than 60% of our industry are uh, SME, semi, uh, small and medium industry, where they are focusing very much on the manufacturing. So therefore, the government, I mean, the, the whole country GDP is actually contributed quite significantly from the manufacturing sectors. And based on the model that we developed, we have an effective post-lockdown if uh, exit strategy to revive the economics uh, during the pandemic or COVID-19 pandemic. So we managed to generate some scenarios and you can see that from the Philippine case study, we analyzed various scenarios to look at what is the impact if uh, we do nothing, we have uh, then some of the sectors might be naturally uncompetitive and they close down and then they will create other issues whereby the 
uh, Amma Brother D and so on and so forth. So we have to have uh, came up with an effective uh, strategy, exit strategy so that we can bounce back to our uh, normal GDP or get back to the reasonable amount of GDP that we achieve in the coming years. So uh, I'll, at the end of this presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Philippine Academic, uh, American Academy of Science and Engineering uh, for the hosting the webinar today. And then we also like to thank uh, Young Scientists Network and Academic Science of Sciences Malaysia, uh, YSN ASM, for being our partners to be hosting our webinar uh, next week in Malaysia uh, to, face, uh, to contact with all the stakeholders and then to look at Malaysia case study in more details. And finally, I would like to thank uh, the project funders, Harawat Global Challenge Research Fund, uh, for all the funding support for this work. So these are all the references that we have used, uh, mainly uh, on the input-output model from the Philippine, Malaysia, Department of Statistics, Malaysia, and some data from the Economic uh, World, Economic Forum, and the others. So I'd like to pause here uh, for, uh, on time. Uh, if you have any question, feel free to ask. We are happy to answer all the questions that you have. Thank you very much. Kay, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Danny Ng. Okay, so thank you so much for those presentations, although I'm also part of the team. Um, okay, so we'll entertain some questions and of course, we have our lead economist with us today to address some of those questions uh, very yeah. much related to the economy. Okay, so we have uh, viewers also on YouTube. And uh, one of the questions is that what would be the assumed political economy situation and how does the said agro-industry sector, uh, coconut for the Philippines and palm oil for Malaysia, will be managed in those specific scenarios? So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's not talk about the politics, political side, because that's a different animal. Well, let's just deal with the numbers here. So, what we've done is to consider the different scenarios. If more money will be put into the other sectors so that we can maintain our um, economic growth or targets, right? Um but what we can take away from our simulations are, first, on the agri-industrial side is that coconut and palm oil are very established um, supply chains in the Philippines and Malaysia. So what we would recommend is for government to also develop other agricultural products because the weather in Malaysia and the Philippines really... Um, is conducive for agricultural development. And this actually boosts our food security. Um, and so if you've noticed in recent news articles, you would hear about farmers throwing out agricultural produce because they couldn't sell. So there are ways for us to um, upscale or increase the returns to these farmers by training them, uh, providing training to um, increase the value, like from instead of selling raw tomatoes, they can make, make canned tomatoes or pasta sauces, which would increase their revenue or profits. And then, yeah, so that's it. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Krista. Um, anyone from the team would, would, would like to add on to that? Okay, so maybe I'll do a follow-up question first for Krista. Okay, so considering the current um, stimulus package that has been provided by the government, um, can you at least uh, um, enlighten us on what are the good things about uh, what the government is doing and how perhaps they can further improve or how should they, um, uh, maybe what are the next steps like um, that, we, that we might be looking at in the coming months? So I can only speak for the Philippines. Maybe yeah. then you can give inputs for Malaysia. Yes, maybe. yes. But um, we have a program, a comprehensive program on it. 
this. Um, it's called PH Progresso or Philippine Program for Recovery with Equity and Solidarity. So it has four pillars. And the first one is for emergency support of vulnerable groups. So this is where the wage subsidies, the, um, the SAP, Social Amelioration Program comes in. And that's already 600 billion pesos. And then the others, or the, re, re, the second pillar is the resource to fight COVID. So these are the health um, equipment and PPEs, etc. And then last, third pillar, you have the fiscal and monetary actions. And bulk of this goes into the infrastructure development. And lastly, the fourth is a recovery plan. And the total cost of this entire PH Progressive program is 1.743 billion. So if you go back to our slides earlier, we talked about um, a three, the Philippine stimulus package being just 381 billion. So why is that? What, where is the difference coming from? Um, we only focused our energies or, or the stimulus package in our si simulation as those that can be classified into the different sectors. So the 600 billion pesos that went into the social amelioration plan uh, program is not included because it goes directly to the informal sector, which are not part of the GDP. And then uh, most of the <laughs> sorry, most of the efforts actually, uh, for example, in agriculture is full directed towards the uh, rice sector. So most, uh, I think around 16 billion pesos was directed, oh, 16 billion out of 19 billion went to the rice industry. We understand that rice is very important in the Philippines. However, there are other crops that also need attention. So if we could expand our coverage, then that would be better. Also for the other um programs. So I think we lack um, support. Also, if we want to, we can tie the social amelioration packages with employment so that um, there's, people are encouraged to work. The, um, we need to um, maintain their employment until we can tide over this pandemic. Once they lose their jobs, once um, businesses start closing down, which is what's happening right now, then we start having an, a problem. How do we encourage these businesses to restart once we open up? So one of the good points is we, the government encouraged um, financial institutions to extend loans, um, give more opportunities for MSMEs so that they could maintain. However, it's not, it may not be enough because um, we can see that a lot of the small businesses have started closing down. Okay, thank you. Um, what about for the Malaysian side? Uh, does anyone want to comment, Denny or Viknesh? I, uh, I will try to address the question first, then Vignesh can top up uh, based on that. In Malaysia government, we actually launched a uh, few times of the uh, simulate package uh, just to cover up or to fight back the um, COVID-19. Um, there are various uh, approach that we came in. Uh, I just want to touch base on one of this uh, launched by 200, 250 billion uh, second economic package whereby we allocated into four uh, uh, measures. Um, one is the 128 billion is used to protect the, uh, we call it uh, citizens' welfare, right, welfare, where they give out uh, some stipends to the uh, eligibility, uh, the, the, the citizens who are eligible. And then they also invested uh, 100 billion to support the small and medium enterprise, whereby, uh, as I mentioned just now, six, more than 60% of the industry or manufacturing sectors in the country are SMEs. Therefore, the government identified them as the primary or the backbones of the economy in the country. 
therefore they receive some of the support. And the other part will be uh, 2 billion will be using as strengthen the economic, uh, country economics. So what they do in the country is they provide a support to the direct injections of funds to the citizens. It's mainly to relax their uh, living expenses. And then we also uh, working with a lot of a banking industry whereby deferment of repayment of our loans. Uh, we have, we have uh, such a schemes for repayment deferment for six months. And then now the parliament is actually looking into whether the deferment will be extended or it will not. Do they lose any? Yeah. So uh, there are quite a lot of uh, package that we have uh, introduced by the government to rescuing the economy in the country. So our what is the Central Bank of Malaysia also dropped twice of our interest rate uh, just to boost up the economy in the country. So maybe, Vignesh, if you have anything to add, please feel free. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I, I think Danny has uh, touched on, on a lot of important uh, points, but I'll just add one particular point related to that. I think uh, the Malaysian uh, stimulus package as well, they actually did also focus on the manufacturing sector. And one thing I'd like to highlight about this is that this is actually consistent with our results that we got from our, our project here. Because our project actually identified the manufacturing sectors as also a critical sector. So it's actually quite consistent with what the Malaysian government is actually rolling out at the present time. But of course, um, that would very much depend on, of course, how they roll out and how much time does it need in order to take the full effect. So in that sense, yeah, in that, uh, that is the one thing I can add about the uh, stimulus package related to Malaysia. Sorry, thank you for that, Danny and uh, Viknesh. So let's move on to the next question from Mike. Um, so thank you so much for the insights on the possible path to post-pandemic recovery in the agro-industrial agri sector. Uh, what I noticed with this pandemic is that it revealed the weak or fragile agri-food supply chain. In this regard, with the proposed method, can the proposed method be extended to provide policy recommendations to address such faulty structure? How could you relate a resilient agri-food supply chain to the sector criticality and vulnerability index mentioned in the study? So who would like to take up that particular question? I'll take a crack at that okay. question. Um, our colleague, Professor Mike Promintilia, of course, is in the heart of coconut country in the Philippines. So hello down there. I hope things are okay in uh, our home province, Quezon province. Um, last month, there was a webinar in the series by Joel Coelho on uh, reconfiguring food supply chains by bringing the farms closer to the cities via, for example, uh, indoor farming and such technologies. I think, how does our technique fit in? Uh, input output analysis is a top down modeling technique. And uh, Leontief himself said it, it's by nature a historical document because you look at last year's or uh, last year's data and then construct the input output table from that. And it's low resolution in the sense that you get a bird's eye view of the economy. On the other hand, uh, the use of reconfigured supply chains is an engineering problem. It's bottom up. And uh, what you would do is uh, actually engineer the building blocks of the technology and fit them into a workable supply chain as was described in the webinar that I referred to. I think what can be done, uh, it should be possible to have a hybrid approach where these proposed new supply chain configurations can be used to retrofit a statistical input output table. In other words, you'd get the data from the, the government office and then you would change the figures to reflect a supply chain configuration that you are considering to implement. What we've done with our indices is uh, you can actually measure the potential effects of those changes before you begin making the changes. In other words, you would be able to tinker with different scenarios. If I do this, how would the criticality change? If I do something else, how would that change? And this is where mathematical models such as this 
are sort of like crystal balls where you can see into the future and make smarter decisions because you can simulate different futures and finally commit to the best one that your model identifies. So I hope that answers at least partly your question. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so the next question comes from uh, Michael Francis Benjamin. So how long until we actually achieve the desired GDPs after infusing the financial stimulus? Okay, Viknesh? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. This is a very good question as well. And in fact, we, as part of the team, we actually discussed this, um, uh, this point uh, that was raised in the question. Um, to answer the question, we look at it as from our results that we obtained, in this project, what we're actually recommending is actually what do we need to get to where we want to be? But the how will be very much dependent on how the governments in the respective countries in the Philippines and Malaysia uh, it would depend on how they plan to roll out this uh, stimulus package or future stimulus packages, uh, as we noted earlier. So we provide the numbers as to what is required for us to achieve a certain economic output in the future. But in a but in terms of how it's going to be done, how long it's going to take, it very much depends on the resources available to the government and the accessibility and a lot of various factors which we would need to consider as well. So at this point, we've only considered uh, what we need in order to get there, yeah. Let, me add, something, to, yeah. Yeah, let me add something to this point. Um, this is really, a very tough question and a lot of it depends on how long the pandemic will persist and it's uh, really outside of the expertise of any of the team members to figure out whether COVID will persist for 12 more months or 18 more months or and so on. So I'll speak in terms of the engineering side and a comment on what is good, what's worse about COVID compared to other disasters that we have experienced historically. Uh, on the one hand, the good thing about this crisis, unlike uh, having a large earthquake or typhoons, is there is no physical damage to economic assets, if you think about it. Uh, if an airline goes bankrupt, the planes are largely intact. And if there was an infusion of funds and enough market for it, you could essentially, with a bit of uh, refurbishment and maintenance, restart those planes uh, quite quickly, unlike if there was actual physical damage to facilities and you would have to physically rebuild production capacity. So that's one difference. Uh, on the downside, of course, the pandemic has this, uh, is not localized, unlike uh, storms, when we regularly have storms passing through the Philippines and you'd have a severe damage, but geologically, geographically isolated in specific provinces. While this pandemic, of course, is uh, essentially all over the country, in fact, all over the world, uh, and thus is more distributed. And in that sense, uh, there is less capability to transfer economic activities to more uh, secure locations, because eventually the, vi the virus will eventually get to you at some point. So that's uh, not quite a direct answer to your question, but those are the considerations when we try to think of how long it will take to bounce back. Uh, final note might be we can learn some lessons from uh, the Spanish flu more than 100 years ago as to give us a ballpark figure of how long it will take to bounce back from a major contagion like this uh, contagion event. So maybe a couple of years is my guesstimate, but as a non-expert. Okay, thank you for that. So let's take another question from the YouTube channel. So this one comes from Angeline Lau. Can validation of the model be performed? If yes, how? Who would like to respond to that particular question? Well, let me take a yeah, crack Raymond again. <laughs> I've had two decades of answering uh, questions about uh, validation of models. And it's really very tricky because this is a real world um, natural experiment taking place. And unlike, um, unlike a lab setup where you can run a control and you can run an 
an experiment with the actual intervention and compare the results, the alternative is never observable in real life. I hope that is, uh, that's a very subtle point, but when you make a policy shift, for example, if you were to go to a counterfactual argument about uh, uh, had we, what would have happened if we tightened or relaxed the lockdowns a bit differently? Uh, would we have more cases now or fewer cases? Would there be less damage on the economy? And once you change that path, you really can never observe the alternative. So in that sense, uh, when we have mathematical models of entire economies, uh, validation is indirect. Uh, number one is we have to have very tight quality assurance on the assumptions. In other words, we want to make sure that the, the model is internally self-consistent so that it, it has correct logic as it does the simulations. And in fact, the, the only other way I know of to do proper validation of a mathematical model is retrospectively. This is done, for instance, when we we have climate simulations to project what happens to, to a global mean temperature in the future. What you would do is travel back in time and try to simulate the present from the past. And if you get reasonable results, then you have a bit of confidence that you can then simulate the future from the present using the same computing framework. So that kind of retrospective validation uh, can be done. And uh, this might be something, that's a good point. This might be something we should do uh, as part of this, a follow-up of this project. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Yes, Viknesh. Yeah, I think I'll add on as well. I think another point for validation is um, when we're using models or developing models such as this, I think one key actor is the data that we get. So if the data is accurate, then of course that goes a long way for us as well. And in that sense, for us, we are actually using data from the Department of Statistics in Malaysia, as well as the counterpart in the Philippines as well. So that's a good starting point for us because we're using data that is published, that is available, and that has already been you know, um, uh, screened through as well by uh, the relevant uh, departments and agencies as well. So that's a good starting point in, in terms of uh, sort of inherently uh, validating the results that we're getting. So that's the point I'd like to add, yeah, thanks. Yeah, Danny? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I may share also some of the things that we can do. Uh, like mentioned by Raymond just now, uh, input ABU model or the model that we develop at the moment is very uh, bird view. It's actually a very big uh, development for the country, uh, simulating the country for the future. Uh, I was fortunate to involve in quite a number of a project uh, under the Academic Science Malaysia, whereby we have drafted the country policy. So when we involve in the policy development, a lot of the things that we have done or what we envision ourselves in the next 10 years or 20 years, how we will recover is mainly based on the expert experience at the same time is what we want to achieve. So it's setting a mission and visions for ourselves, then we drive ourselves towards the directions. So I think the simulation or the model that we develop is mainly to give us an idea what is going to be and look like if we do whatever we have done now. Again, it may deviate. Again, for example, when I was young, we were having a vision 2020. We feel like we're having a flying cars in Malaysia, although we are trying to, but unfortunately we fail. Uh, there are a lot of a development, become a developed country 30 years ago. But because of the, all the crisis, all the uncertainty that we came in, uh, the country has not able to achieve whatever we have ambitions. But again, it's uh, something that we said upon every citizens is trying to go towards the same directions. On the other notes is, as we mentioned, this is a very big upward view. There are some validation or some of the things that we can do is uh, the locality or the significance of the each sectors. For example, I have a long discussion with my team yesterday uh, when we said, okay, palm oil is impacted. Um, uh, 25% are in operability based on the index of measure that we have simulated or we measured. 
uh, I have to ensure that the answer, the 25% is reflective of what happened in the ground. Because in Malaysia, when we started about this course, thing, all this palm oil are not listed as the control movement order. Because uh, we say palm oil is the primary or important food supply chain. So the government actually relaxed the palm oil mills and the plantation to continue operate, although the other sectors are shut down. So with that kind of perception in place, then when we say 25% in our property, is it something reflective to the reality? People will say, no, uh, maybe not. Why? Because I have still working, everyone is still working, still producing power. Why is actually 25% immobility in this case? So after a discussion, we actually identify saying that what we notice at the end is the reduction of demand. Indirectly, the exports has declared, decreased in China and Indonesia, uh, India. This is the main exports country that we have. Because of the export had declined, at the same time, also reductions of the price of palm oil. That actually impact the drop of the economic performance of the palm oil industry. And based on all this analysis in detail on each sector, we are able to validate the model that we generated the 25% is representative because we know actually in real, in the ground, it happened. Although people will say, oh, no, we, not 25% of people losing job. No, that's not the answer, but it's 25% of the efficiency has decreased because of the productivity have dropped, the demand has dropped, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that is a good uh, discussion that we had. And then I think that is the good representative that we, we had uh, done based on the results. So. Okay, thank yeah. you very much for that, Danny, and, and uh, the others. Um, okay, um, since Danny mentioned that he's very much um, in discussion with uh, some of the stakeholders in Malaysia. So this is a follow-up question in YouTube by Rodelius Abade. So how do you intend to communicate your results to government considering that there are uh, well, for the Philipp uh, 25 million people who are dependent on the Philippine coconut industry and maybe the same, uh, more or less, a lot of people also that are um, associated with the palm oil industry. So um, from the Philippine team, may I know who wants to, to address Maybe I can topic. start first from Malaysia okay, then all right, and Malaysia give a bit time okay, for the Philippines. Any. All right, thanks. Uh, we had... Uh, I would say one of the output of this project is engagement with the policyholders. I would say we are a bit fortunate uh, to manage to get a uh, young scientist network and academic science Malaysia on board to work with us to disseminate our results, uh, the model that we develop. And therefore, on the next coming Friday, uh, we actually already organized a webinar to engage with all the stakeholders of my majority of the main important palm oil stakeholders in Malaysia, including of the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, including of the, all the agency which is related to palm oil, include uh, Malaysia Palm Oil Power Board, Malaysia Palm Oil Council, and then uh, um, and quite a number of uh, N NGO, WWF, and so on and so forth, who are interested on palm oil. And just fortunate that I'm, I'm part of the Malaysia Sustainable Palm Oil uh, Certifications Technical Committee. I, I know quite a number of them, actually, I invited most of them. They're actually happy to be part of this. So with their input and they understand the output of this result, uh, we hope that they can bring it back to their respective society to carry out, to discuss, and to, to talk about all these initiatives that we should have. Because every time before the government announcing of any, uh, all this support or similar package, they actually conducted a consultations uh, with the respective stakeholders. So the moment we can share with all these activities, all these results with this respective stakeholders, they can be sending the right voice to the policy makers. At the same time, uh, SM is very influential. I would say they are playing a very important role in national policy making process. Uh, most of the time, ministry, before they make any uh, recommendations, they always go back to Academic Science Malaysia to conduct some certain study. So we are very working very closely with Academic Science Malaysia. So I believe that kind of result will be able to translate 
to the policy in the near future. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Denny. Um, yeah, so I just want to uh, clarify the academic sciences in Malaysia. Is it um, similar to the National Academy of Science and Technology in the Philippines? Raymond, may maybe you can respond to that. Yes, ASM is the counterpart of NAST in the Philippines. Okay, and would you and like to answer on behalf of the uh, Philippines? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll answer as, a, as an academic and not representing any particular organization. Uh, in general, our role is to come up with these insights and ideas. And we have two outlets. One is a scientific outlet and where we target to get our work published in a scientific journal. But nowadays, of course, it's also important, especially for an issue such as COVID, it's important to get the same information and package it differently and aim it at a different audience, uh, which might include non-specialists, but might include people who would actually use the information to make policies. And this webinar is part of that effort. Uh, the reason we're doing webinars in both countries, although the geographic locale actually doesn't count if it's a webinar, but um, this is part of the effort. What we will also do is uh, we'll continue to engage uh, colleagues in uh, contacts in media and government, uh, probably write up a policy-oriented brief about our results and uh, send those to various uh, government agencies that may or may not be able to use the information. And the final point about this is in academia, our role is really to to get our science right and make the recommendations as best we can. Uh, it's not really our role to, to make the decisions or policies for the people. It's, it's for us to come up with correct answers and uh, hope that uh, the information is used properly to make decisions that affect the, the constituencies of entire governments. Already. Thank you for that. I was muted. Um, we have another question. This one comes from Giselle. So Giselle is in the audience in Zoom. Um, can you compare and analyze the major differences in the on-the-ground engineering manufacturing technologies used in coconut and palm oil industries in the Philippines and Malaysia, which may spell the difference of impact of any economic stimulus? What new advanced fundamental techno technologies would you recommend aside from indoor urban farming that the government should support? What is technological tra training of MSMEs and the cost required for this one? I would like to, to respond. Okay, Raymond, go. Uh, since I'm, I'm familiar with both industries, uh, having yeah. grown up- uh, Having, being 50% Malaysian. <laughs> Well, I visited a few palm oil mills, but I actually grew up in a coconut oil mill, literally for, uh, that was a small family business back in the day. Um, even though the trees look the same from a distance, the actual process of making the two oils are very different. Um, to summarize very quickly, in the coconut industry, the oil bearing part of the coconut is separated from all of the biomass, the, the husk and the shell, is separated in the farm. And it's only the copra, the dried meat, which contains the oil that is shipped to the various refineries where it's mechanically pressed to squeeze out the oil and then refined thereafter. And the refining, of course, looks the same for both of these sectors. The palm oil mill, um, the palm oil industry is a bit different because what happens, it's, it's the entire fruit which is taken from the plantations and brought to the palm oil mills. And that's where all the biomass is stripped away from the oil bearing part of the fruit, which is the, I forget what it's called, but it's, uh, um, there are two parts of the fruit which are oil bearing, and that gives you both palm oil on one hand, and then the palm kernel itself can then be a source of palm kernel oil. But it also means that because of the way the supply chain works, all of that waste biomass is consolidated in the plant and is actually available for use for various downstream industrial products. Unlike in the Philippines, all the biomass is left behind dispersed in the farms. And this is a major logistical difference because 
for example, Danny and uh, of course Vic Nash when he was a PhD student, uh, did plenty of work on biorefineries where you would take these waste biomass from palm oils and use it as a raw material to make chemicals and high value products because it's already there uh, in huge piles in these palm oil mills. In the Philippines, if there's a bit of a logistical difficulty because if we were to try to do this, it would entail a second step of having a supply chain to take all of that waste biomass, the shell and the husk, and then transporting them to factories where you could make high value products out of them. So that's a major challenge. Uh, in terms of scale as well, the, the business and economic side of it is in Malaysia, there are a lot of, there's plenty of economies of scale. These palm oil mills are typically much larger than our coconut mills. Likewise, the plantation firms uh, are also typically very large and there's plenty of vertical integration. While um, in the Philippines, for example, because of land reform, it have smaller uh, plantation sizes and in that case, we probably have not been able to optimize the yields. Uh, you, a final statistical note, one-tenth of the Philippines land area is uh, coconut plantation area. But in terms of the output, it doesn't compare to the oil output from palm, which is much more intensively cultivated in countries such as Malaysia. OK, thank you for that. Um, so I'll, I'll move on. To hopefully the last question. Uh, okay, so this is from May Lim. Um, it was posted on YouTube. So demand is currently sur sur suppressed because of fewer um, restaurants being open and thus less demand for oil. How much role does storage and the possible lack of it due to non-use of products affect the model? Okay, yes. Okay, Viknesh. Um, perhaps I could put my uh, inputs into this question and then perhaps the rest of the team also can chip in as well. Um, what our model actually looks at is actually the one of the things is of course the economic output itself. So how it actually translates down to the lowest resolution, that is something that of course has to be uh, planned further in fact. So that is like a, I would say another deeper level optimization and decision making that needs to be done. From our standpoint, from at least the top-down uh, point of view or perspective, is more just sort of recommending or sort of telling people that this is what the performance of that sector is looking into or currently performing at at this point. But in terms of the storage, like what the question asked, uh, that is a detail that we have not looked into at, at this point because that is going to another level in which we have to look into. Yeah. But of course, uh, the, the rest can... Uh, yes, okay. well. Th thank you for that, Viknesh. Um, any um, additional inputs from the rest? Uh, just one quick point. Uh, Input-output models are snapshot models of yeah. economies in the sense that price effects are not present in the model. There's the assumption of fixed prices of goods. Now, this is actually... Uh, this is an assumption which skews the results of input output models because, uh, let me give an example. Back in March or April, at one point, there were places on earth where the price of petroleum became negative mm -hmm. for exactly the same reason that you mentioned. And that is a price effect because the drop in demand changes the price and there's a complex feedback between the market response to the drop in price and, and such. And there's actually a modeling technique which is based on I.O., but sort of I.O. on steroids, if you will, <laughs> uh, CGE. It's a computable general equation, uh, general equilibrium modeling, which integrates such price effects. But that has been, given the two-month time frame of our study, the, the emergency nature of the work, we decided that the approximations that we can get from I.O. would be sufficient to gain at least some insights on how to best manage the crisis. Uh, uh, always with, with a view towards declaring the assumptions and limitations of the modeling techniques that we use. 
Okay, so thank you. I think we've exhausted all of the questions. Um, ah, yeah, there was one question. Um, they wanted to know if you'd be willing to share a copy of the slides as well as um, a document, maybe a, the paper, the final paper, to some of our viewers. So maybe, may I know who the viewers should contact or communicate with to get the, to get information? Okay. Uh, I'll say one other thing. Uh, and because this work, uh, we're preparing a peer reviewed, uh, uh, a manuscript for peer review. And uh, what we're seeing now is the major commercial publishers make uh, COVID related papers mm -hmm. open access, free to the public, even if you don't have a subscription. So it's a matter of waiting for that paper to be written up and submitted and peer reviewed and eventually published. And we'll probably post a link in both, in all the institutions involved, we'll post a link which will allow free access to the manuscript. Okay, thank you. Um, and before we, we close, maybe uh, I'd like to ask Vitnesh, uh, since you're the project lead of this particular project, what would be the next steps and what are you looking at um, as a follow-up on this particular study? Um, okay, thanks, Kate. Um, there's two important things I'd like to mention. Firstly, of course, uh, we have already uh, conducted our webinar here in the, I mean, for the Philippines uh, uh, side. Now on the next week, uh, next Friday, we'll be meeting the stakeholders in Malaysia and then uh, presenting our results uh, more focused on the Malaysia side as well and getting inputs and uh, feedback from them. But of course, in the long term uh, for this project as well, so we're not just doing this for the sake of doing a project, we're looking at this thing in a more long term because of course, and that's actually the second point I'm going to bring up as well uh, later on. But the focus here is of course to uh, uh, work with policymakers to write policy briefs, and then uh, of course to get more involved in policy making. And this project is a stepping stone for us to do that. In fact, another thing that we're planning to look at is uh, something that is already in the works that we're going to start off. We have, I think, the data to kick us off in this direction is also to look at the corresponding uh, greenhouse gas emissions resulting from this uh, case mm -hmm. or from this uh, pandemic as well. So, I mean, of course, <laughs> it's going to be controversial if I say that yeah, the pandemic has uh, reduced our carbon emissions, but I would say that it's more of this pandemic actually has given us some lessons. And one of these lessons could be is that uh, judging by how we have uh, operated our economic system as a whole, uh, how would we obtain or target carbon reductions accordingly, or how can we bring in impact towards the carbon emissions and uh, in, in our fight to reduce carbon emissions. So of course, yes, the pandemic is bad on its own, but the lessons that we get out of it is that in some sectors, perhaps we could have operated from maybe working from home, you know, but, in, and, but yet we still drive to work, you see? So this is just some of the examples of the lessons that we could get from this. And that is going to be something that we are looking at, looking at the corresponding uh, GHG emissions, and also other um, objectives as well in the project as well. But another additional point that I was going to say is that uh, I hope that uh, this webinar is a, a very useful starting point, not just for us as the project members, but for those listening in through the Zoom uh, platform and also those who are listening in uh, on YouTube. First of all, thank you very much for your questions. Really helpful, very useful questions. And in fact, very uh, good for stimulating discussion as well. And a second thing is also, um, I'm, I'm hoping that this stimulates more discussions and as well as more potential collaborations. What I would like to uh, use this opportunity here is to uh, sort of make a declaration that we are welcoming you know, collaborations further. If you are working in this similar area or intend to work in this area, please feel free to get in touch with us because we're not just looking at this as a project, we're looking at this as something that we could contribute to the uh, to the world in fact and whether regardless of malaysia regardless of the philippines at the end of the day we are one human race and the fight is for i mean it's our fight all right so even though in malaysia we are in the recovery phase but you know at the end of the day we are all still one human race right so in that sense some of you may wonder you know you're not on the front line you're not fighting this pandemic uh, directly but of course some of us who are in the back line i use the term the back line right providing support. And one way we can provide support is put the science, put the engineering, put the research into the places that it needs to be 
so that we could work together and come up with good solutions. And I think this is a good starting point for them. So by all means, we highly welcome collaborations and to extend this work even further as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that, Viknesh. Um, before we close the session, let me just share my screen to plug the activities of PAASE in the succeeding days, succeeding weeks. Okay, so hold on. Okay, so we're done with this one today. So starting Monday, so July 20, all the way to August 14. Hold on, let me just check. Okay, all the way to August 14, we will be celebrating the 40th Paase anniversary and the 2020 annual Paase meeting and symposium. So we will be having sessions every day from 8 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock um, Philippine Standard Time. So if you want to have a look at the program, you can uh, scan this QR code and it will direct you to the link for um for the entire program, but uh, I'd like to plug the very first um, session that we will be having, which is on Monday. So this is the opening plenary session. Um, so you can find the link if you want to register, please go to the program link and all the information will be there and you can actually click on the individual um, sessions so that um, you can register yourself or if you're interested to watch it via YouTube, uh, the YouTube links are also there. Um, maybe I can invite uh, Giselle to say uh, something. So Giselle is the current president of the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering. So Giselle, would you have any words for our participants today? Um, thank you, Kay, for the opportunity to uh, talk about 40th APAMS. But before I do that, I'd like to strongly recommend that the DLSU team led by Raymond Tan uh, convey your modeling results to the NEDA and the Department of Agriculture. And we should try best to help you with that, Raymond. So congratulations on your work. Now, uh, Raymond will be one of our plenary speakers on um, July 22, but our opening session is on July 20, that's Monday, and it's on uh, the um, topic of uh, COVID-19, which the PAASE, the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, tried best to address with early responses, as early as March. So at this um, first session, we will have a panel discussion of our PAASE members who are newly elected to the National Academy of Science and Technology. Then we will have as our keynote speaker, the former secretary of the NEDA, National Economic Development Authority, who is a chair, honorary chair of this 40th APAM celebration. And then we will have Paula Borromeo of the Ayala Health Group to talk about the integrated measures that his company, the Ayala conglomerate, took to try to get their employees back to work. So I think uh, Ayala Health is a good example of how major industry involved in a lot of manufacturing, telecommunications, real estate, etc., cetera, um, has been very proactive in taking steps to contain COVID and getting uh, the uh, economy contributed by the private sector back on its feet. So I'd like to thank our um, uh, speakers and participants from outside the Philippines, the Malaysian team. There's so much that we can learn from you regarding uh, using advanced technologies and systems, other economic and um, uh, industrial systems to um, improve the production of um, oil, in our case, coconut oil and other products from coconut. There's so much that needs to be done as far as the coconut industry is concerned in the Philippines. So thank you very much, Kay, for this opportunity. And uh, if you share the whole scientific program, you'll see that there's everything. There's something for everyone in the program. We have over 200 presentations uh, by Filipinos who live in the 
Philippines, in the United States, and elsewhere in the world. There will be posters by our undergraduate and graduate students. And it's just telling you that uh, the, um, the scientific life um, in the Philippines is uh, growing with, with everyone's contributions. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Giselle. So I hope that you guys can join us. Um, so I hope that you guys can join us in uh, the celebration of the 40th ASE anniversary. Okay, so um, so again, so we are present in Facebook. Um, you can find us at uh, fil um, yeah in our official web uh, official Paase Facebook page. We also have our web page, which is at paase.org, and the webinars that we are hosting. So the recordings will be posted in our YouTube channel, which is at bit.ly slash paase webinars. Okay. Okay, so that's it for us uh, this morning. So if there's nothing else, thank you again for joining us. Um, because of the celebration of uh, Paase, the webinars will, will be on hold, but we have the Paase uh, anniversary sessions that you can uh, join. So thank you again, everyone, and uh, see you in our future webinars. Bye, guys.